Okay, we're about to get going here. We want to clock in a moment. Okay, so this is the second hour of hemoglobin. Um, and I stopped a few slides after that, this one that I'm showing on the screen uh, this morning. Um, but I just wanted to go through this a little bit more because uh, I think we have time to do this. Um, I don't want you to get caught up in the mathematics here because I'm not going to ask a specific quantitative question about this. Um, although it has the same detail that I go through in pH problems. Um, the pH stuff is meant to be a detailed introduction to understanding blood gases so that you can do some quantitative stuff with blood gases and interpreting blood gases. Okay. Um, and you'll see that on Monday that clinicians actually do this kind of stuff. Here, I just want to make sure that you appreciate that this dissociation constant and this dissociation equilibrium constant and then substitution with partial pressure to make this a P50 makes sense to you. What we've done here is we've moved the concentration of the ligated myoglobin over in the P50 over to the right to come up with this form of the equation. And then on the next slide, we're going to substitute this into an equation for y. So y is essentially the fraction ligated divided by the total. OK, so appreciate it's a one to one binder. So this is just a fraction bound divided by the total, unbound and bound. All right, and so we're going to substitute into the MbO2, that equation from above. So it's this equation substituted and this same equation substituted in the denominator. And then all the Mbs cancel because there's a term in each one of them. Okay, and then if we multiply and divide by P50, this term in the numerator goes away, this term in the denominator goes away, but this other term becomes P50. So this is actually divided by this whole thing here, right? All right, and so now we have Y is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen divided by partial pressure of oxygen plus P50. So again, this is showing you that there's another way of getting fractional saturation. Okay, and then one minus Y is the fraction unsaturated or unbound. Okay, and so notice Y is done in a way so that it goes from zero to one. Okay, and so to do one minus Y, you just simply use P50 over PO2, which is the same as the denominator. So that's one minus y, and that's the PO2 minus over the same denominator, okay? And so you cancel the oxygen, and you get then y over 1 minus y, and if you rearrange terms here, you will see that you get PO2 over P50, okay? And now we're going to take a logarithm. All right, and so now you take a logarithm and this generates what is called the Hill equation or what I call a Hill plot, all right? So it's the log of Y over one minus Y is equal to the log of the PO2 and then the log of a quotient is the difference of the logs minus the log of P50. So for a single site, 
or non-cooperative sites a, a plot of log y over one minus y versus log PO2 is linear with a slope of one. And we know it's a slope of one because there's nothing in front of the log term. Okay. And so the, that's what that will give you. And the intercept of the log P50 will give you the KD. And the intercept occurs when this quote, this ratio is one and the log is zero. For cooperative sites, a hill plot is more complicated. We're not going to derive all of this at all, but the difference reduces to the fact that there's a difference in the slope. It's a much more complicated sort of question, but the difference is that it's the slope that changes in a cooperative binding event. Up above, we said this is going to be hyperbolic. This is going to be sigmoidal, okay? But the difference, therefore, is the information we get out of this slope. And then this constant is still going to give you something about the intercept, something about the affinity, all right? So uh, I always show this plot um, that came out of some book by Devlin, and it shows the hill plot versus log PO2, so the log of the ratio of the saturated over the unsaturated, and it shows a slope for myoglobin, where NH equals 1, and then a slope for hemoglobin, where NH equals 2.8. Now, the thing you need to appreciate is NH has some meaning. It ends up being the hill coefficient, and it, in principle, tells you the number of sites. Okay? So the number of sites you already know now is 4, right? But we're getting a value of 2.8. So what that means is that the cooperativity is not perfect. You don't have none bound and four bound. You have none bound with intermediates leading up to four. And so this is a reflection of the cooperativity and how many intermediates are populated. All right. Now, as written here or as drawn here, this is not really very informative. These authors simplified stuff. And it leaves out some important information, all right? And so I usually go to the board and draw something. Oh, goodness. What I drew is gone. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so I'm going to redraw it. I drew this in PowerPoint, but it didn't save it. Wow. Oh, it's on your PowerPoint. So you can see it on your PowerPoint. It's not in the PDF. Go forward one slide, he says. No. Okay. So what's on your PowerPoint is a plot that looks like this. Okay. And it's the log of the oxygen concentration right here. And over here, it's a plot. There's going to be a midpoint here. It's going to be a plot of that Hill coefficient of log over uh, y over 1 minus y. Okay. And on the, when I drew this, I actually had to redraw it because I made it too close to this point right here. So this point right here is the zero point. Let's put it over here so you know that. Because the log of one is zero, and so that will be the intercept when we draw the intercept line, okay? And then there's going to be a, a, log, a line that looks like this that may be too steep. And there's going to be a line that looks like this. Let me undo those. There's going to be a line that looks like this, and there's going to be a line that looks like this, okay? This intercept corresponds essentially to the affinity. So since it's on the low side here in concentration, it means the halfway point is high affinity, so it's a low concentration for the KD. And the high point over here means that it's, did I say high affinity? It's low concentration, so it's high affinity. Out here, it's high concentration, so it's low affinity, all right? So this is the high affinity form, which we call R. This is the low affinity form that we call T, all right? Okay, so what happens during binding to hemoglobin is that the binding starts out as T, and then it transitions 
the R. All right? And so I normally draw this on the board, as I say. And so what happens in the solution is oxygen binds to the first site, and then the affinity begins to increase in that molecule. And then some binds to the second site, and the affinity goes up, and the third site, it goes up. And then eventually it transitions to being the high affinity form, okay? The slope in the hill plot, and this is not clearly drawn here because this looks a little too vertical, that you're seeing in that plot is right here. That's the hill coefficient that we're getting out of the cooperative binding. And that's the slope that corresponds to this equation and this coefficient, all right? And so it's always difficult to sort of draw these things so they're proper. Okay, so what happens in oxygen binding to hemoglobin? What happens in cooperative binding of a ligand to a cooperative macromolecule is it starts out binding with low affinity, it transitions to high affinity, and it ends up binding to the high affinity form. So it converts the confirmation that is the low affinity to the confirmation that it is the high affinity during the binding process, all right? So that's what's going on here. Okay. Now, what does that accomplish? What does that achieve? All right. And so this is out of an old edition of Stryer. It's a relationship between the Hill coefficient and what they call the cooperative index. Okay. So for a non-cooperative binder like myoglobin, NH is 1. And so the cooperative index is 81. So what that means is to go from 10% to 90%, you have to change the concentration 81 fold. You have to almost change the concentration by two orders of magnitude to change the saturation from 10% to 90%. Okay. That has something to do with the ratio of um, in the in the uh, equilibrium constant, basically, or in the free energy diagram. You go from 10% to 90%, you're going from 1 over 9 to 9 over 1. Okay, and the ratio of that ends up being an 81. However, if the ratio is 2 point, if the, excuse me, the Hill coefficient is 2.8, that means you only have to change this cooperativity index by a factor of five. You can go from 10% to 90% by simply changing the partial pressure of oxygen fivefold. Okay. And as this number changes, it changes the concentration over which things change. So when I look at binding data, often plotted on a log scale, I'm looking to see if it changes over two orders of magnitude or tighter. If it's tighter, it's cooperative. If it's two orders of magnitude, it's non-cooperative. You can sort of see that in the shape of the plot. So what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is shown here. If we have fractional saturation versus partial pressure of oxygen, and notice this is not a log scale now, okay? Or is that a log scale? Maybe that is a log scale. No, that's not a log scale. That's not a log scale. Here we have hyperbolic, and here we have sigmoidal binding. For the hyperbolic binding, if I want to go from 10% to 90%, I have to change things to some concentration way out off of the slide. You can't see my pen when I go way out there. So I need an 80-fold concentration change to make this transition. But the lungs are at 100, and the tissues are at 20. So if I had a non-cooperative binding system for delivery, I would never get above 60%, and I would never deliver less than 20%. Okay. But if I have a cooperative binding system, I'm going to saturate in the lungs. But then as I go down this curve, I only need to go down about fivefold. I need to go to about 20. And I'm going to dump a whole bunch of that oxygen off because I'm transitioning from the R state up here to the T state down here. So I'm going down that curve that I just drew for you on the other plot. Okay. So the advantage of sigmoidal is the steepness of this curve and the fractional saturation, the change in the fractional saturation over a narrow concentration range. 
That's the beauty of cooperativity. That's the whole point of cooperativity. All right. So you should understand this concept, sigmoidal binding versus non-cooperative binding. And the sigmoidal binding allows a big change in binding over a narrow change in ligand concentration. It makes the binding responsive to the ligand concentration or the substrate, substrate concentration, if this is an enzyme, and makes it fine tunable. It makes it more adjustable. Okay. Now, what pictorially is happening is that the first oxygen binding step slightly increases the affinity as indicated by the thickness of this line. The second oxygen binding step makes it even higher affinity. The third higher, the fourth higher still, okay? So that transition that I was drawing in that curve is reflecting an increase in affinity going from T to R. So this is the oxygen cascade that we talk about in some ways, although it's usually meant in terms of concentration. But the point here is, is that the affinity increases with increasing binding. Oxygen is a positive allosteric effector. When it binds to its macromolecule, when it binds to hemoglobin, it positively increases the affinity. It's allosteric because the binding of one site affects the binding at other sites. It increases the affinity at other sites in the molecule. Okay. Okay. Now let's talk about some of the transitions that um, are occurring in the structure. So the deoxy form, as we already saw, has the iron slightly outside of the plane. It has four ligands. The electronic configuration is too large for the heme pocket. There are some repulsive interactions that um, I won't talk about involving the proximal histidine and another group, valine E11. Okay, and there are favorable intersubunit salt bridges between the C helix and the junction between the F and the G helix. This salt bridge is actually holding those subunits into that conformation and stabilizing the deoxy form. All right. The oxy form has a sixth ligand. The oxygen binds, converts the iron to the sixth ligand form. It pulls the iron and the proximal histidine into or towards the heme. The motion of the F helix destabilizes this salt bridge. The heme moves 1.5 angstroms into the heme pocket. So this puckered structure becomes flat. And a quaternary transition occurs. The dimer interface rotates. Okay. So this is sort of a pictorial sort of talk through what happens going from deoxy to oxy. I want you to appreciate, and I usually say this when I'm in class with you, this is not a light switch, okay? This is a transition from one structure with one energy to another structure with another energy. And this structure is more stable under the five ligand form. This structure is more stable on the six ligand form, and the energy switches to the oxy form. All right, so here's an energetic pic or a, a space filling picture of what we're talking about. And the, here's the FG interface that, that we're talking about. Okay, and uh, here's the, what's going on at the salt bridge. Okay, so there are lots of interactions. Don't worry about all of these interactions. All I want you to appreciate is that there's an imidazole that is protonated that is making a hydrogen bond to a carboxyl. Okay, so normally this proton flies in in the PowerPoint. So that may happen if you flip through your PowerPoint, all right? And it shows you that that's the Bohr proton. Notice it's a midazole H uh, plus, all right? So that's stabilizing the salt bridge, okay? Now oxygen binds somewhere else down the way. The helix moves. It drags this imidazole away from the salt bridge. And now suddenly the hydrogen bond is no longer sta stabilizing the protonated state and the proton is released. 
Now, it's not 100% released. It's simply a shift in the PK. Okay, it's a shift in the PK that makes the proton more dissociable. Okay. So this is depicted in a slightly different picture with slightly different uh, rendition where there's some kind of a, a hydrogen bond between, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm adding over here. There's some kind of a hydrogen bond between a histidine and an aspartic acid. And that added proton is the Bohr proton. We talk about this as though it's the Bohr proton. Uh, this is really a global phenomenon, number of protons released, all right? And this is the deoxy configuration. This stabilizes deoxy. When this helix moves, it increases the probability the proton can leave. It sh effectively shifts the pK to a higher value, to a lower value, so it's more likely to dissociate at pH 7.4, okay? And so in, you've accomplished two things. You're now allowing a conformational change to occur, and you've delivered a proton. And remember all those slides from yesterday where the proton that came off suddenly added on to bicarb, carbonic acid, CO2, breathe it out. Okay? All right. So I'm going to get to a question that's over here on the left in a second. Okay? Um, and people are beginning to contribute stuff, and I'm going to have to jump in pretty soon. All right? So there are a couple of different models for how we think about this. Okay, one is known as the Manot Wyman Changeau model, the MWC model, or what is referred to as the all or none model. This was developed in the early 60s by Manot Wyman and Changeau. Okay? The idea is that there are two conformations the tetramer is in a deoxy form or the tetramer is in an oxy form. Okay? And there's an equilibrium between these forms. All right? And so you can see without oxygen binding, the deoxy form, the bigger arrow is up, predominates. As oxygen binds, the equilibrium shifts, and a little more of the hemoglobin becomes oxy. And another oxygen binds, and a little more of the hemoglobin becomes oxy form, et cetera. More oxy, more oxy. Okay? So somebody asked a question over here. Is there a specific point when it changes from deoxy to oxy? Okay. Is it when the first one binds? No, you simply shift an equilibrium. More is in the oxy. Is it when the second one binds? Maybe not, but more of it is in the oxy. Three bind, more. Four bind, more still. Notice there's always a little bit of deoxy. It's an equilibrium. It's never zero. Okay. It might be a big shift. It's almost all oxy, but there's an equilibrium, okay? So that's the idea. Don't think of it as a light switch. Think of it as a rheostat, all right? Now, there's a competing model out there. It's called the sequential model, okay? The idea is, is that we start out in some conformation, a uh, deoxy conformation, and oxygen binds. And the local tertiary structure of that subunit changes, and some of the interactions change between it and the other residues, but not all of them. It's sequential. It's not all or none. And then another ligand binds, and tertiary structure changes in that subunit. The interactions change with the other subunits, but it doesn't flip over completely. The same thing happens with three. The same thing happens with four, okay? So we can do all or none, we can do sequential. Both of these basically explain the model and both of these basically explain what's happening with the data. It turns out that it's not completely the truth and the data has suggested that there's some other switch that occurs. Early on it's sequential and then it becomes all or none. Okay, and I won't go through the, the, the papers that describe this from the 80s and 90s are absolutely beautiful papers. They come out of uh, Gary Aker's lab. Um, he did a lot of this work at Hopkins before he went to Wash U and at Wash U. Um, 
And it showed that there were not two states, but three states. There was some intermediate state before it flipped, okay? And so this is known as the hybrid model, sequential until you cross some dimer interface. Meaning if the ligands are within a dimer, then it doesn't flip. But once an oxygen molecule crosses the barrier, and it binds in the other side. Remember, these are alpha one, beta one, alpha two, beta two. Then it flips. So this has it flipping at three. But if this second ligand had bound here, then it would flip. Okay. So this sequential model is better for a full description of all of the data. All right. It doesn't change things from your perspective, although you should be aware of Manoa, Wyman, and Changeau and sequential models. These models, especially the sequential model, which is also known as the Koshlin uh, Nemethy Filmer model, because some guy named Koshlin Nemethy and Filmer developed it, um, is used in a lot of enzyme catalysis models. Okay. So the issue here is that this model distinguishes between quaternary transitions and tertiary structure transitions. So it's a little bit more detailed and a little bit more complicated. Okay. Now, that's the basic model. And that describes positive allosteric effector. That describes oxygen binding. But what about all of these other effectors? Okay. All right, and so somebody wrote over here in your comments, deoxy and oxy are not dictated by oxygen binding. They should be dictated by 2,3-BPG, proton, and or CO2, okay? So the first part of that sentence isn't quite right. Deoxy and oxy are dictated by oxygen binding, but they're also influenced by 2,3-BPG, protons, and CO2, okay? All of these guys play a role. So the hemoglobin model is all or none, okay? It's a, it's a sigmoidal binding curve. It's a cooperative binding curve, okay? But if you change the concentrations of these negative allosteric effectors, then you will shift the curve. So remember what I just said. We're going from pH 7, 6 in this panel to pH 7, 2. By lowering the pH, we're raising the proton concentration. By lowering the pH, we're shifting the curve to the right. That means that the livery improves because if you look down here and ask how much falls off at some low partial pressure of oxygen, you can see there's some additional loss of oxygen here, all right? And so, yes, oxygen affects the shape of the sigmoidal curve. That's built into the hemoglobin transition. But pH shifts it to the right, and by shifting it to the right, a greater amount of oxygen can be achieved, a greater amount of oxygen can be delivered. So pH, or proton concentration, is a negative allosteric effector, effector and a right shift causes an increase in delivery, okay? So that's what the negative guys are doing. Now, this is known as the Bohr effect because increased acid lowers the pH, in favors, increases the CO2 um, binding, and increases O2 dissociation. So remember this summary curve that I wrote before, okay? Oxygen binds, proton comes off, all right? So by increasing the proton concentration, proton binds, oxygen comes off, okay? So again, it's not all or none, but it shifts the equilibrium. And what was fivefold might now be fourfold. We might do a little bit better job of delivery, okay? So the shift to the right has a really big role in this. <clears throat> okay, now here's an overview of what we've been talking about just to put this back into a context of the overview, all right? In the lungs, oxygen is high, it saturates, the color of the blood is actually red because the iron has a color, 
it's fully saturated. It's 95, 98, 99 percent, 100 percent saturated. It goes to the tissues. At the tissues, the pH is different. At the tissues, the O2 concentration is different. Up here, it's 100. Down here, it's 20 or less. So the oxygen falls off. Okay, so you've delivered oxygen. But there's also a high concentration of CO2 here. So CO2 now binds. CO2 binding is now going to flip the hemoglo hemoglobin over to a deoxy form, carbamino hemoglobin binding to the end terminus. The color of the blood starts to change colors. It starts to be blue. Look at the, the color of your blood through your skin if you can see it. You can't always see it. You have to have veins on the surface that make it possible. Okay, and, and you have to have the right color contrast. But then now it's carrying CO2 and protons, and they're now going to get delivered to the, to, the, to the lungs. The concentration of CO2 is low, so it will release the CO2. The oxygen is high. It's going to force the CO2 off, and we've completed a cycle. Okay? So the transition is being pushed by oxygen binding into oxy, CO2 binding into deoxy. It's being pushed by delivering of oxygen at low partial pressure of oxygen, but higher concentration of CO2 and lower pH, okay? So all of these things are happening at each point in this transition. Now, what, uh, what else affects this, okay? So temperature also affects this. It's not surprising that temperature would have some kind of a contribution on macromolecular, macromolecular structure and oxygen binding. All right. <clears throat> so here's a plot of saturation versus PO2. Notice out here at 100, everybody is saturated. Down here, you're getting delivery. But notice, as you drop the temperature, the curve shifts to the left. By shifting to the left, you stop delivering oxygen. It stays saturated. Okay. So when you get cold, really cold, okay, you can't deliver oxygen. You will essentially die from oxygen deprivation, okay? But when you get warm, when you get a fever above 37, 38 degrees, it will actually improve delivery of oxygen. So the argument made is that fever or exercise allows an increase in oxygen delivery, okay? This may be a little bit hand waving, but you can quite see, quite clearly see a right shift. Okay, so our right shift improves delivery, exercise or fever. So when you're in a fevered state, you need more energy, you need more oxfos, et cetera. That may make sense. Okay, low temperature is clearly not good for the body, although it has something to do with cooling down a body and preserving what's going on in the body by decreasing oxygen utilization during surgery, okay? So the very, at the very most you should know, or the very least you should know, left shift is caused by lower temperature, right shift is caused by higher temperature. Okay, now uh, Ernest over here also mentioned 2,3-BPG. Yes, is the increase in delivery also true for the right shift from decreased pH? Yes, they all work. You're going to see that in the next, sub, sub, the next few slides. Okay, so we're not done. CO2 is a negative effector. Proton is a negative effector. But there's also an effector called bisphosphoglycerate in the old days, or 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or DPG, okay? This molecule is synthesized in the erythrocytes, okay? Erythrocytes don't have mitochondria. So they make energy by glycolysis, the end point of which is lactic acid, which is one of the sources of lactic acid in your blood, okay? And so this is the pathway you're gonna be talking about in glycolysis. But there's a branch point where this 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate can be pulled away to make 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, okay? It uses up some of the substrate that's gonna be used to make ATP right here in this step, okay? But it creates a 
factor that is a negative allosteric effector in hemoglobin. All right, so what does it do? It turns out that 2,3-BPG has one binding site in the interior of the hemoglobin molecule. It's a single site, binds to a positively charged cavity formed by the beta chains. And you can see the cavity has plus groups, so side chains that are positively charged that facilitates the binding of this negatively charged molecule. All right. So <clears throat> we have a transition between T and R. We push to R with oxygen. We push to T with CO2 and proton. But BPG is a third negative effector, and it pulls this form into a more stable deoxy form. So it favors the deoxy form even more. Okay. So again, it's not all or none, but it shifts the curve. All right. Now, I want you to notice this point, and we're going to make this point again and again. Fetal hemoglobin binds BPG weakly. It's because it has mutations in its sequence that are not positively charged. Okay. So, BPG binds very weakly to um, fetal hemoglobin, it's the gamma beta chain. Okay. Thus, it never causes a right shift, as I'm going to show you. And thus, it has higher affinity for oxygen than the mother's hemoglobin A. Okay, so let's see if we can look at that in a slightly different way. So here's a more detailed um, stick figure of the BPG binding site. Notice it's histidines and lysines, positive charges that favor DPG binding. It's in the interior of the pocket, okay? Uh, in oxy, that rotation of dimers sort of collapses the pocket, so it also can't bind sterically. All right, and so let's begin to put that together now in a more complicated story. Here's myoglobin. Here's normal red blood cells. That, so that's hyperbolic. Here's normal red blood cells that have um, BPG and CO2 and protons and whatever else is in there. So the curve is shifted way out here. The half point is out here around 26, okay? If you strip the hemoglobin, what that means is you take the DPG out, you get a left shift. So reduced DPG causes a left shift, the affinity goes up. So the other way to say this is DPG causes a right shift. Increasing the DPG concentration increases it more to the right, okay? Reducing the DPG concentration causes a shift to the left, all right? So I put this little note up here because it's discussed in Lippincott's briefly, okay? Stored blood for transfusion loses BPG during the process of, of storage. So it causes a slight increase in the oxygen affinity, and this potentially makes it a trap for oxygen when you first give it to a patient, okay? So it suddenly has a higher oxygen affinity. It won't deliver blood as well. All right. Well, the caveat is how much blood do you get? Because the blood you have has BPG in it. And so as soon as you get that blood, BPG will bind and it will start to curve back towards or shift back towards normal. All right. Part of the idea for blood transfusions in bicycle racers, they okay, think Lance, okay, is not so much that they're delivering something with high affinity or low affinity, they're increasing their oxygen carrier. They're actually increasing the amount of oxygen carrier that they have in their blood, so they're able to carry and deliver more oxygen. So it's a concentration effect. It's not an affinity effect. Okay. So this is shown a little differently here, but this reiterates what I've just said. Okay, saturation versus oxygen. Myoglobin is tight down around one hyperbolic. Hemoglobin A, the adult form, is uh, uh, sigmoidal with a midpoint around 26. Fetal hemoglobin is shipped to the left because it can't bind BPG, so its affinity is higher. Down here on this scale, it looks like it's down around uh, 15. Okay, and so it's shifted to the left with higher affinity. Okay, 
I'm going to come back to that. I should actually have moved that slide. I'm going to come back to that, and I'm going to say it a couple more ways. Okay? So we're talking about BPG. We're talking about CO2. We're talking about protons. So here's a plot showing you sequential titratable behavior. Here's hemoglobin stripped. Here's hemoglobin with 5 millimolar BPG. Here's hemoglobin with 8 millimolar BPG. So you can see it's titratable. There's a binding affinity, and as you add more BPG, it shifts further and further to the right. Okay? So the point of this slide is, is that the shift is dependent on BPG concentration, how much BPG you have in your solution. So how much do you and I have in our bloodstream? Okay. And can that change in a demonstrable way? And can it change on purpose or because of pathology? Okay. So BPG levels increase due to high altitude. Huh. If that happens, then you'll have more BPG. The curve will shift more to the right. You'll get better delivery. What does altitude have to do with it? The Kenyans have been training at high altitude for over 60 years. Okay, They appeared on the stage internationally in the 60s in the Mexico Olympics. All right, So people now all over the world train, runners train at high altitude to increase their BPG concentrations to improve their oxygen delivery. Okay, So that's something you can do on purpose. People who have emphysema, people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease also have increased BPG levels. Well, why is that? Because they can't get oxygen in normal levels. Their lungs aren't working. Their gas exchange doesn't work. Okay, So they naturally increase their BPG concentrations, and consequently, consequently, they get better delivery of what they have. Okay? Okay, and there are other conditions that have to do with reduced amount of delivery, reduced amount of red blood cells, okay? And those conditions will also impact BPG. The body will respond by increasing BPG, okay? So shift to the right occurs soon after birth. That's because we start out with fetal hemoglobin, and then we shift to adult hemoglobin. We start out with predominantly fetal and we shift to predominantly adult. So the apparent curve shifts to the right with time. Simply fetal hemoglobin synthesis decreases, adult hemoglobin synthesis increases. You restore BPG sensitivity in the body and you get a right shift just over time in young children. Okay. Now, uh, no, masks, I doubt it. Now, somebody is asking over here if, are we likely to increase BPG due to wearing masks? Or is CO2 inhalation only going to change acidity and thus proton binding? Well, the fact that you might be breathing in more CO2 might have something to do with it. That may be a role. Uh, the way most people wear their masks below their nose loose around their face? I certainly don't think so. If you're wearing a fancy mask like they have in the ER, like they have in critical care, uh, with a ventilator where they're actually getting oxygen on, on top of it, uh, probably not. Okay. So here's the point about fetal hemoglobin and why those two slides should be closer together. The mother's hemoglobin looks like this in blue. And at the tissues, it's delivering oxygen. But now that oxygen has to flow across the placenta and get to the fetus. So it flows across the placenta, and the oxygen concentration is now even lower. So the fetal hemoglobin has to have a higher affinity so it can bind the oxygen that crosses the placenta. Okay, And so this encourages the transport of the oxygen it diffuses across the placenta, and then the hemoglobin picks it up, and then it delivers it to the tissue. All right? So these phenomena, these negative allosteric effectors, are additive, essentially. 
at pH 7.4, this is what the curve looks like. Okay, if you lower the pH, increase the proton concentration, the curve shifts to the right. If you lower the pH and increase the CO2 concentration, the curve shifts to the right again. Okay, so all of them contribute to this shift. Remember again, it's a rheostat. Okay, proton has a shift, CO2 has a shift, BPG has a shift. Okay, so all of them are binding with some affinity and all of them are causing the shift in the binding curve. So the CO2 concentration, recall, is this carbamino binding at the end termini that favors the deoxy form. And the overall uh, change that we're talking about is shown here, where the deoxy form is favored by these negative heterotrophic allosteric effectors, hetero because it's affecting oxygen. They shift to this form, deliver oxygen. Oxygen itself shifts the curve to the right, releasing some CO2, BPG, and proton. Again, these are all equilibrium, okay? There are small shifts that shift that curve right and left, and that shift improves and delivers more oxygen, okay? So that's the overview. So let me come over here and just see where we're going with comments. Okay, positive means increasing oxygen affinity. Negative means decreasing oxygen affinity. So the positive refers to the mean ligand that's being transported. Hemoglobin is built to transport oxygen. No, both factors do not shift to the right. Okay, oxygen binding shifts the curve actually to the left because it increases affinity going from low affinity to high affinity. Okay, the negative factors shift it to the right. Okay, and so in exams, I tend to ask a lot of questions. What shifts it to the right? What shifts it to the left? Okay, so increased proton, decreased pH shifts it to the right. But increased pH, decreased proton shifts it to the left. Okay, CO2 shifts it to the right. So hypercapnia, which is high CO2, shifts it to the right. Hypocapnia, low CO2, shifts it to the left. Okay. okay. High P, uh, DPG, that's the old term. 2,3 BPG is the new term, shifts it to the right. Decreased BPG shifts it to the left. Okay. Again, it's all cumulative. It's all subtle shifts from one way to the other. Okay. Now... Your um, book has a summary, structural details, heterodimer, alpha, beta structures, okay, two types, protoporphyrin 9, heme, oxygen binding, increasing affinity with oxygen binding, allosteric effectors. Oxygen is also an allosteric effector. Here they're showing you the negative allosteric reflect, uh, effectors shifting from the R form to the T form. And then they introduce this idea of carbon monoxide here, which is discussed in your book and I sometimes ask about. CO2 binds to hemoglobin really tightly, 200 and something fold tighter. So it binds to the oxygen binding site, okay? What it does is it stabilizes the deoxy form. So even one bound begins to affect negatively oxygen binding. Two bound, more so, three bound, et cetera. So it causes a really big left shift and it makes oxygen delivery difficult, if not impossible. So carbon monoxide will kill you by decreasing oxygen delivery. And then there's a summary here on hemoglobinopathies. Uh, this is a topic for later. Uh, the whole idea about hemoglobin S, hemoglobin C, hemoglobin SC, and all of the thalassemias, decreased synthesis of chains, okay? And how that also is inheritable and how that also affects pathology, okay? All right, so somebody says my video is being weird. 
All right. And so that's one of the things you need to sort of give us feedback on. Give us feedback on whether this is coming through clearly to everyone. To me, I sound pretty good. I can hear my own voice. I can hear my echo. I can see my own picture in the screen. I can see the slides. I'm assuming this is getting to you. So this is a Wi-Fi thing. This is a Canvas big blue button thing. I don't know. I don't know what the problems might be. The recording presumably is the backup for everybody if there's a problem. All right. Okay. It may just be Wi-Fi, and that's one of the reasons why the recordings are great. It was one of the reasons that I started making backup recordings, but that was just taking too much time for me to make backup recordings. Okay. So I also have here questions, examples of questions. Okay. Uh, we're sort of running out of time, and I want to transition to the other slide, but we can do some of these quickly. So which of the following statements concerning hemoglobin is correct? Fetal blood has a higher affinity for oxygen than does adult blood because fetal blood has a decreased affinity for 2,3-BPG. Ha, huh, that's a right answer. Purified hemoglobin F stripped of BPG. Well, it's not stripped of BPG. It's always stripped of BPG. It doesn't bind BPG, so that makes this a wrong answer. The chain composition of hemoglobin F is alpha 2, delta 2. No, that's the minor adult form. Hemoglobin A1C differs from hemoglobin A by a single genetically determined amino acid substitution. No, this is the sugar modified. This is the glycated form that is a measure of glucose regulation. Hemoglobin A2 appears early in fetal life. No, this is an adult form. Okay. So there will be questions like this that are sort of just going across details. The Bohr effect results in a lower affinity for oxygen and higher pH values. Okay, so the Bohr effect is usually a proton-induced effect. High pH is decreased proton concentration. Okay, so the Bohr effect in results in a lower affinity at lower pH values. Carbon dioxide increases the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin by binding to the amino terminal group of the polypeptide chains. It does bind there, but it doesn't increase, it decreases the oxygen affinity. The oxygen affinity of hemoglobin increases as the percent saturation increases. Yes, that's the true one. The hemoglobin concentration, the hemoglobin tetramer binds four molecules of BPG. No, it binds one. Oxy and deoxy have the same affinity for protons. No, the salt bridge is in the deoxy form. The oxygen binding breaks the salt linkage, releases the proton. A mother with sickle cell trait in six months pregnant, fly, six months present, pregnant flies to visit her mother. What is the danger that the fetus will have a sickle cell crisis? I'm pausing, I'm pausing, I'm pausing. The fetus is an expressing adult form. So the fetus is not yet expressing hemoglobin S. So there's no danger to the fetus. Okay, so I'm gonna end this section <clears throat> and I'm going to close this recording because we're gonna begin enzymes on the hour. Okay, so you will be kicked out. I presume you get kicked out. And then you will rejoin when I start the enzyme block. All right, so I'll see you in eight minutes.